So it's all about putting it together now. And the purpose of this presentation and the series of presentations is to give you the context from a fire service perspective of what, of how to apply the Incident Command System 100 material to your environment so that you don't have to try to make the mental leap and the cognitive load to be all technical and say, okay, how does that apply to my environment? How does that apply to my department, my service? So I am here to give you a generic application of the ICS um, content so that it makes sense to you within the fire service. That is the whole purpose here. Now, recognizing that this is just a scenario and we are not replacing anything that you do day to day in the fire service. That's not the intent of this scenario. It's not in, intended to say this is exactly how it's supposed to go, go, this is how it should go, this is how it needs to go. It's merely a vehicle to bridge the gap between the fire service and, and what you know through fire ground command and, and the way your service does standard operating procedures and so on and so forth. And what does it look like from an ICS perspective? So let's get started. Here's the situation. Now note that this is based on a real event, but for obvious reasons, it has been altered in terms of some of the names, the exact locations, dates and times and so on and so forth. And the reason for that is obviously due to confidentiality, but also the fact that this is meant just as a, a demonstration or an example only. So it takes place in Slave Lake, Alberta. Now Slave Lake is a community a couple of hours north of Edmonton, Alberta. And so Slave Lake is characterized by a, uh, it's surrounded by huge tracts of forest, uh, main highways, and it is also well known because of the 2011 wildfires that ripped through uh, the town there. So you may have heard of, of that in 2011. And if not, I'd encourage you to, to Google that. It is absolutely uh, an incredible story and really is a, a t testament to responders doing what they can do to save a town and uh, everyone's to be applauded and commended for working in that environment. So the time is 1317 hours, June 17th. A call is received via 911. The caller states that they were driving southbound on Highway 2, which is a major highway, and saw a column of smoke to the east, just off the highway north of Canyon Creek. So right away, hall number one of Slave Lake Fire Department, a department of both paid and volunteer firefighters, is paged out. As per their SOPs and their package and their template, units number 121 and 151 are dispatched. Now, they are captained by a Les McBurney you like that? Les McBurney? He is the captain of unit number 121. That sets the stage for the rest of the scenario that will be coming. So what we'll be doing is we'll be introducing or we'll be summarizing the uh, ICS material, the units, using the rest of this particular scenario. So stay tuned. So post unit three and four, basic principles and features of the incident command system and the incident commander. So if you'll recall, we have a column of smoke that has been called in, a couple of units have been dispatched. So en route, Captain McBurney is going through potential problems and figuring out what he'll need the crew to do. When he sees the column of smoke, he knows this could get ugly in a hurry, so he calls for a page out of additional halls and resources. He thinks to himself, man, oh man, this could be really, really interesting. Now, he is the officer on the first arriving engine and assumes command. So it is his scene. So it's his incident right now. And in ICS terms, he is the incident commander. Right now, the organization is small and the command is direct. He has unit 121 and he has unit number 151 at this point. Keeping in mind that he does have other, in, uh, other engines and other resources coming. Now, two additional units arrive in addition to 121 and 151 shortly thereafter. So that is an, out of hall number two. A couple of extra units now arrive. So at this point, he is the IC and those even arriving units, even though they have their own command and control within the, the trucks, they are falling within 
the incident commander's purview or his direction. So at this early stage, he is fulfilling all the ICS functions. He is doing command, so he's facilitating. He's doing planning, so he's coming up with some objectives. He's doing operations, the function of operations, because he's deploying resources. He's fulfilling logistics, and in fact, he already did that right off the bat when he called for additional resources. As well, he's doing the safety officer because in the absence of a designated safety officer, the incident commander takes on that role specifically. And also the finance and admin piece. Now, in this particular case, dispatch is also fulfilling that role or his agency. So it's not up to him to necessarily keep track of costs, but he is ultimately responsible for those exact resources on scene and what the costs are and so on and so forth. Now, when the incident commander has arrived, he's done his windshield survey, and now he's doing his size up, and it includes any threats to these three ICS priorities. Life safety, incident stabilization, and the property and the environment. Part of what's going into this is, what kind of problems do we have? What are the threats to these priorities? What can we do to keep this from getting worse? What other properties and other values are at risk? All of these things are going into his size up. So he's actually fulfilling all of those roles, the, the, the command, the ops, the planning, logistics, finance, and min. He's doing a size up, which in ICS terms means he's actually starting his P post as well. Now, after coming up with strategies and tactics in his head, the IC directs the crews to begin working the situation based on their training and experience. They start to act on the IC's plan. Within their own crews, they're maintaining their own accountability through their officers, while the IC has overall accountability for who is where doing what. Now that the resources have been deployed, the IC now starts to focus on the logistics functions even more. He calls for additional types or kinds of resources, if not already requested, because he's already, he's now done his size up. He's figured out what problems he has. He's figured out what values at risk there are, what priorities are being threatened. He's also getting updates on ETA so that he can plan for when the resources will be available and then can be assigned to doing something. So now the IC has deployed his resources. The crews are now all reporting into him directly because at this point, span of control isn't a major issue. He has a handful of units. He's able to directly influence what they're doing and give them direction. He's conducted his size up. He's figured out what threats he has to his priorities. So life safety, environment, and also incident stabilization. But at this point, he is now joined by Chief Coots. Now, Chief Coots is the head of the department. And given the potential for this to escalate in a real hurry, Chief Coots has deemed it necessary to head out to the scene and get a face-to-face -face and get eyes on what the operation is all about. So the incident commander and Chief Coots conduct a briefing or situation report. So within that sit rep goes the, the threats to the priorities, some of the problems that are existing, what is being done to solve some of those problems, where are the crews, so from an accountability perspective, a whole bunch of other things that, uh, that go into that. So now Chief Coots has a few options available to him as we've discussed in the ICS program. He can either leave command as is, or he can take command and maybe assign the captain to an operational role, or he can hand off command to somebody else entirely. Well, in this particular case, Chief Coots recognizes that there's a whole bunch of other agencies coming down the pipe as well. And this thing, as I said, could get big in a hurry. So what he decides to do is he decides to take command and now gives Captain McBurnsey a role within the operations section as the fire suppression group supervisor. So in other words, he is now just going to be looking after fire suppression only. Now, in the spirit of incident command, Chief Coots 
is also doing the planning role. So he continues to come up with objectives in his head, solve problems, uh, come up with strategies, and then the tactics, and then they get enacted by the operations chief, or sorry, in this particular case, the group supervisor. Chief Coots is now the incident commander. He is also responsible for logistics. So he is interfacing with dispatch, calling additional resources as required. And now at this point, it is very formal where the finance admin is being fulfilled by the Lesser Slave Lake Regional Fire Service. So on the dispatch side, again, they're continuing to track all of these things. But this is what the org chart looks like. Chief Coots is now the incident commander. Mc Bernsey is the group supervisor for fire suppression. Now keep in mind that group is a function. So there is a function being done, which is fire suppression. All right, so now at this point though, recognizing that there's an evacuation that needs to be done potentially, uh, maybe some highway traffic closures, all sorts of things like that. Chief Coots or the incident commander is joined by a member of the local law enforcement agency, in this particular case, the RCMP. Her name is Corporal Marsha McDavid. So when she arrives, they discuss the situation and recognize pretty quickly that there are some residents in the area. So those will need to be dealt with as well. There is a major highway and a whole bunch of other roads coming into this area. So they are going to need to secure the area, the scene, the perimeter from people continuing to come into this, into the scene. So right now we've got a few problems. We've got the fire. We've got the evacuation requirements around the residences and we have a highway and numerous roads that need to be cordoned off. So those are the immediate problems that the incident commander and Corporal Marshall McDavid have figured out that they need to tackle. So far we've seen now an incident that started from just a smoke investigation. So a call in column of smoke off the highway to a couple of units with a an incident commander in charge on scene arriving, doing a size up, calling in additional resources. And then from there, if you recall, Chief Coots arrived and he had a number of options with regard to taking over or not taking over uh, command. But in this particular case, he recognized this thing could get big in a hurry. And he really wanted to make sure that he had the right people in the right positions and the right organization in place. So he put Captain McBurnsey, who was previously the incident commander, and he became the group supervisor for fire suppression. So a group is a function. So there was a, a group created that is responsible strictly for fire suppression. Now this time, or by this time, the incident commander was joined by a member of the RCMP, a corporal by the name of Marsha McDavid. They had a conversation and they decided that in addition to the fire, obviously that is going on right now and causing the column of smoke, there were some residences in the area as well as a number of roads, including a major highway that is leading into and out of the immediate perimeter. So we have a few different problems that need to be fixed and handled and that's where it takes us to now. This is what our org chart looks like right now. Jamie Coots, the incident commander, a staging area has been established. A fire suppression group has been created. And remember a group is a function as well. There's an evacuation group and that is staffed by RCMP officers at this point. And that is being managed by Corporal McDavid. There is also a problem around perimeter security and perimeter containment. And that problem is being solved by a perimeter containment group. And this group is made up of peace officers and the local public works organization because the evacuation is being conducted by the RCMP members, so law enforcement. So we have in this case, the fire suppression group, which is made up of Slave Lake firefighters. We have an evacuation group, which is being made up of the RCMP or law enforcement in this particular case. And we have now the perimeter containment group and their job is to keep the entire area contained, keep people from coming into it. And that is being staffed by peace officers as well as local public works. So they've set up barricades and vehicles and so on and so forth. So we have a whole bunch of activity going on on the ground. 
Both Chief Coots and Corporal McDavid get on the phone now with wildfire management and their incident commander for this particular incident. Through this discussion, it's determined that air assets would be more useful than ground attack at this point, as the wind and terrain is definitely not in the favor of ground crews to prevent the spread. They also decide to form unified command given the potential escalation, the resources being required from the different agencies, and the need to come up with common objectives. Key point, the common objectives. And because they're communicating and coordinating together, the three incident commanders who have now formed Unified Command, decide that the air resources will not begin suppression operations until Chief Coots notifies Wildfire that all ground personnel are out of the area and accounted for. So a brief action plan is determined and Chief Coots directs his group supervisor, so fire suppression group supervisors, to remove his firefighters from the area and bring them back to staging while the RCMP corporal updates her team and tells them to be aware of the air operations going on, but there will not be a direct impact on that. As well, she notifies the perimeter containment group supervisor that air operations will be starting, but again, it will not directly impact their operations at this time. So what does it look like again? We have three incident commanders previously, but what has been decided is they become now Unified Command, and they come up with some objectives. The Unified Command, command objectives are as follows. Perimeter security in place by 1,400 hours, and that includes the north-south of Highway 2, Range Road 80 to our Range Road 82, east of Highway 2 to the Western Lake Shore. Another objective is have evacuated Division A, Alpha, which is the Canyon Creek subdivision by 1530 hours and the fire contained to four hectares by 1500 hours. So what does it look like in terms of the rest of the chain of command? We have the fire suppression group still. We now have a wildfire management branch and this branch is primarily at this point looking after the air operations and we have a division alpha which has now been created because that is a Canyon Creek subdivision and it was a good geographic area and that will be needing to be evacuated. So we have a division alpha supervisor or division supervisor in place. And within this division, we have the RCMP, we have peace officers. Now we have local Slave Lake search and rescue and public works all working within this division. So we see how these three, the group, the branch and the divisions can all work together uh, so it, there are no hard and fast rules with regard to how this is organized. So we have the group, which is a function. We have a branch, which is either geographic or function. But in this case, it's the wildfire management. And we have a division, which is a geographic boundary or delineation for our particular incident. And it is being taken care of by a division supervisor. We now have an incident command post, or at least we've had an incident command post the entire time. And in this particular case, it is Chief Coots original unit number 103. So on site, we actually have now Chief Coots, we have Corporal McDavid, but we also have the wildfire management uh, incident commander, but remember, they're operating as unified command. There are a couple of staging areas right now established. One staging area is for the fire suppression units, those particular resources, and given the risk to the uh, responders as well as potential issues within the subdivision if you recall division alpha which is now being evacuated there's also a staging area for ems being established because of the huge air operations requirement there is a heli base that has been established and that's at the local airport and that's being managed primarily by wildfire so moving forward what happens if this continues to escalate? Well, there are a number of things that will start to happen. There will be a municipal emergency coordination center stood up for the evacuees. So in this particular case, they've been evacuating Division Alpha, which is Canyon Creek subdivision. Those people have to have somewhere to go. So while an ECC or emergency operations center is beyond the scope of this course, there is a requirement for an ECC to be stood up to handle the influx of evacuees. 
There will now be a dedicated information officer and a team designated. So previously, the information officer, if it wasn't formally designated, that would be starting with the original incident commander, the captain that arrived on scene. It would have got uh, or been transferred over to Chief Kutz, who became the incident commander. And then when they formed Unified Command, Unified Command would be filling that function. But as this has grown, they now have a dedicated information officer and a team in place. Because of the proximity of the fire to the Canyon Creek subdivision, there will be a structural protection branch also established, and that will be managed and manned primarily by more municipal type apparatus. So you're, this is now where you'll get your ladder trucks, maybe you'll uh, have sprinklers deployed, something like that, all falling within the unified command structure. That's the important part. And in addition, we will likely have an evacuation alert and we'll have an expanded evacuation area if this fire continues to spread. And that it now becomes where we need to really consistently and constantly evaluate P post. So there you have a kind of one day wonder of an incident that started with just that initial smoke investigation and the arriving uh, engines. So two units primarily to start and they were looked after by an incident commander who was the officer of the first arriving uh, unit. It was joined by another two apparatus or, or units from additional an additional hall but still falling within the incident the original incident commander's purview and then chief coots arrived and while he is senior in rank within the department it is not an automatic that he takes control unless that's an sop so he had a number of options available to it to him could have kept the captain as the incident commander Chief Coots could have fallen into planning logistics roles, something like that. Or Chief Coots could take on the incident commander role and now designate the captain to do an operations role. And it was the last option that Chief Coots went with. He became the incident commander and the previous IC fell into operations, which is actually an excellent decision because who better knows the operation than the person that was first arriving on scene. And then Chief Coots, the incident commander, was joined by Corporal Marsha McDavid from the RCMP or the local law enforcement agency because of the requirement around the highway. And also there were some other areas or some, some residences within the initial kind of danger zone that needed to be dealt with. So the RCMP dealt with the evacuation and then also ask the local police off, police, or peace officers and public works to now contain the area. So set up some barricades, keep people from coming uh, into the area because we had obviously a, a fire going on. And then wildfire became involved because their SOP is also to deploy resources. And in this particular case, helicopters. So recognizing that wildfire was involved the RCMP was involved, so local law enforcement and the fire department. Those three entities, those three incident commanders decided to form Unified Command. And from Unified Command came common objectives. And once they arrived on those objectives, they could now create an organization that handled or met those objectives. So there was the Fire Suppression Group, which is a functional group. There came now the wildfire management branch, primarily an air show in this particular case, and then Canyon Creek, which was actually, it became a division, a division alpha, because that entire subdivision actually needed to be evacuated upon further review. So that would be looked after by a division supervisor. Now, if the fire continued to move, then you would get the emergency coordination center stood up. And in fact, even if it hadn't moved a lot, depending on the number of evacuees, the ECC would have been stood up anyways to handle those evacuees. You'd have that dedicated information officer. You'd have a structural protection branch potentially established. And then you would have an additional evacuation alert and expanded evacuation area. So you can see all of the accountability is just built into the whole system. Span of control is built into the whole system. If you're working managing by objectives, the organization 
just falls into place and everybody knows who is who's doing what, what they're doing, who they report to, regardless of agency. So notice that the corporal didn't stay the corporal, Chief Coots didn't remain the chief, and the wildfire management IC didn't remain as the wildfire management IC. They came together and formed unified command. So hopefully this gives you at least a sense for how the incident command system works applied to a fire service scenario and a scenario that's very, very common. Just replace the column of smoke out in the forest with maybe a structure fire. You name the enemy, it could be a flood, anything like that. This progression or the principles that we've talked about in this scenario will apply. So hopefully that helps you take the ICS content and put it into the fire service context so that it makes a lot more sense to you.